Hey. What's going can on? Can you see me? I can see you. <laughs> How you doing? Right. Looks like Good. You, looks like you're in a vehicle. I'm in, yeah. Okay. I'm in between meetings, so this is my only uh, private space. Okay. Meetings, I thought you had the week off. Well, I was in Berkeley just now, and then I'm going um, over here in Oakland where I live uh, to connect with someone else. You okay. know, and I'm interviewing with you, so you know I stay busy. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. That's cool. That's cool. I appreciate that. So how's everything going in North Carolina? Oh, all is well. It's been raining a lot, which is a nice change. Okay. And, uh... Yeah, and it's nice to have a day or two off. I, I work Christmas Eve since I work at um, Stanford's Memorial Church, so okay. I'm a little eager to get that over with. But, uh, yeah, other than that, it's been pretty chill. Okay. All right, cool. We're getting and how, Go ahead. All is well there? Yeah, we had some snow a few days ago. It's warmed up, so we haven't rained. We've had, like, some 70-degree Fahrenheit weather over the past few weeks, so that's very atypical. Oh, well Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds warm. It is. It's very atypical for the Northwest, for Ohio. I said Northwest. Yeah. I mean, Midwest. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's cool. We take it as it comes. And uh, today it's a little bit of rain and clouds, but it's, it's, it's chill one way or another. So, yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. So, thank you uh, for, for coming through. And, um, uh, just to give you some background on on what this is this project is about, um, as you know, I do interfaith work, and uh, I also do mixed ethnicity advocacy as well. And so, um, my observation in the interfaith world and in the interfaith realm is that there tends to be a lot of boxing, like people claim a box uh, and an identity and, and fit in that box, and there tends to be a certain aversion towards the blurring between those boxes. Uh, people are concerned with proselytizing and, and everything else, so everybody wants to maintain their own respective identity and know how to engage others according to their self-proclaimed identity of others. So um, it tends to be, there, there's, there tends to be that culture. Uh, and then in the mixed ethnicity realm, uh, there tends to be an aversion towards religion and spirituality just in general. Uh, there tends to be, there's a lot of talk about identity and belonging and community but and so religion is intrinsically involved in the conversation but when it comes to explicitly addressing that experience and, and talking about it it's kind of like the elephant in the room that gets left unaddressed so this project is kind of like mixing those worlds together uh, and, and, and building and, and addressing the confluence of those experiences um, and just and particularly for mixed people but also for anybody to talk about the experience of spirituality uh, and how it informs one's um, experience as being a mixed person. Um, so that's the basic uh, gist of this project. Um, so I've got five questions. Um, if, okay. if you're ready for it, um, we, can just, we can just dive into it. Does that sound cool? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I was, I'm glad you explained a bit more because I was like, so what is this mix, mixed ethnicity advocacy thing that you do? Okay. And so it's interesting even to hear, to hear your take on uh, knowing that there's a aversion to the religiosity and spirituality or so forth from that view. And so um, I'll just be interested to hear what you learn from me and others and like what sort of conclusions you to or next steps. Yeah, I'll give you some further background just on the mixed ethnicity point. So a few years ago, I attended a conference called the Critical Mixed Race Studies Conference at DePaul University. Um, and so it basically features and involves academics, young um, professors and, and uh, PhD students who are interested in, in critically studying the, the multiracial mixed ethnicity experience. Uh, and so okay. with the idea of providing uh, publish, publishable articles and works addressing this experience, giving it credibility, including it within the critical mixed race, or excuse me, the critical race theory and, and, and studies, um, and, and building a forum and, and dialogue for this experience and, and legitimacy and, and, and validating that experience. So um, over yeah. the past 20, 30 years, there have been a number of organizations, a lot of, of which are in California, 
uh, that, that advocate the mixed ethnicity experience uh, and just identifying as mixed race and not having to choose one side or another or something like that. Uh, particularly like with the, um, the census um, and, and formal um, documents that, that signify what the, the, the ethnic heritage of individuals. So uh, this is something that's burgeoning, it's comparatively new, um, but, but there's, a, there's an increasing um, uh, population and, and uh, community that is coalescing around this experience. So uh, I've, I've gone to a few conferences and um, um, I'm involved with a number of organizations and, and activists that are, that are doing this type of work. So um, that's, that's some of my experience in that realm. Well, um, this is so interesting to me because I know you haven't even asked a question yet, but um, yeah, yeah just being of, of mixed race and you know how often it is that um, it's easier for everyone else to put us in a box, right? Mm -hmm. You like psychological people just want to be able to place us so that they can then sort of have whatever stereotypes or knowledge they hold come into place, you know? Right. It's a comfort thing for other people. Yeah. Um, and so to think about how um, that has really made me into the person that I, you know, am today, how much it influenced me to have to define myself for others' comfort sure. um, and to think about it. Um, so I'm good. I'm really glad to hear there's so much research about this. I've probably, you know, I haven't done enough sort of the academia or journal, you know, reading on this topic, but it definitely is of interest to me. And I, I think I have the same sense of, you know, being a person of mixed race, just, you know, where is that community or what community do I belong to? So I definitely identify with sort of that, that, that need to, to be okay with the being mixed, but also like recognizing that in it, of itself can be that community um and so anywho let's get let's get on with this what are your questions cool cool cool. all right so uh, i mean we can talk on for days about that too as well um but right? uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the questions so um and also just i'm, I'm recording this just for your information so um okay i was like oh yeah it shows a red <laughs> beautiful, button like, all right. beautiful. so <laughs> earlier too <laughs> Just for you. All right, okay. cool. All right, so um, the first question. This might be the most difficult question, uh, and it's it's often like the the most controversial or awkward question uh, because people kind okay. of. So we'll just get that over with at the beginning. Um, so the question is uh, basically in two parts. What is the ethnic background and the spiritual background of your father, and what is the ethnic background and the spiritual background of your mother? You know what? This is, it's not awkward at all. I'm so used yeah. to answering it. Of course. I know. And people, I, it made, people ask that all the time. A lot of mixed people have, have a, um, a resentment towards people asking that question, particularly because it's to, to, to pigeonhole somebody or something else like that. But this is an open-ended kind of conversational question. So. Yeah, and I definitely understand the, like, not wanting to sort of put yourself in a box. But I'm, I'm actually, I feel like I'm so desensitized, like, to the question. I'm totally fine, uh, you know, answering it. All right. So, uh, to tell you about uh, my father, uh, he's from, he was born in Michigan. He's a white man um, of German, French, English, every sort of European background. Okay. Um, and I don't even know how long they were here in the U.S. So it's sort of that idea of like the generic white American. Okay. That's what my name is. Sure. Um, and he was raised and baptized Methodist. Okay. Um, that's his background. Um, and then my mom is Filipino. She was born in the Philippines. Um, and so she was raised Catholic. And um, but if you know anything about the Philippines, there's a lot of indigenous traditions, a lot of sort of uh, beliefs around the, the earth around you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a clear term for this belief system, but it definitely had a role in the day to day life and how one engaged with the world around them and with others. Right. And so I don't have a term for that. But that was definitely a part of her religious and spiritual background. Okay, cool. So uh, a tag along question that, that I'm asking a number of friends 
uh, from that, this is kind of like question 1.2, um, is uh, given the, 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 the different backgrounds of your parents, how do your parents meet? Ah, yeah. So um, my dad um, was, uh, what's the term? Uh, a hippie, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> he, he joined the he must have been a flower child because I think he's a he's a bit uh, younger than maybe the right age. But he joined the Peace Corps in the '70s, and he ended up um, loving it so much he he stayed in the Philippines. The maximum amount of years you could stay in the Peace Corps was like five or six years. Okay. He stayed there the whole time. Wow. Um, and so he's fluent in Tagalog. Uh, he you know lived um, the life of Filipinos, and it was pretty cool. He was doing sort of microfinance back in the day okay. um, there in the Philippines, and they would give money, small business loans to women um, who wanted to start businesses. Okay. And it just happened that in the city where my dad was placed, um, my mom happened to be working at. Um, I guess you'd call it a gift shop, a very small, they call them sorry, sorry stores. Okay. Um, it, and sorry, sorry, I think it means like mixed. It's like your little convenience store. Yeah. And so she just happened to be in the neighborhood. He was working and somehow I guess they had friends of friends and met and um, yeah, they got married, I think in 1975 or something like that. And then, and, um, and that was right around the last, um, the long the end of his service as a Peace Corps volunteer, and uh, so he brought her back to the class. Awesome, that's cool. <laughs> his myth. So, well, I guess I, I yelled a little bit, I guess, and the microphone got some reverberation there. Uh, anyway, so ah. cool. That's that's an awesome story. So, uh, I think just like with mixed people, it's always interesting to, to to hear like how the stories of how the parents come together and 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 uh, forge that union together with each other. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, so going on to question number two, um, All right. what do your parents teach you as a child, um, in terms of religion or spirituality or just ethics or life lessons about the world and, and people or, or anything like what, what are some of the, the lessons that stand out to you that your parents teach you? Interesting. So, um, I think Although my dad was Methodist, he was very open to just Christianity in general. And so um, my sister and I uh, were raised Catholic. We went to Mass every Sunday. Okay. Though if we happened to be um, visiting Grandma, we'd go to Grandma's church, which was Methodist. Okay. And to me as a child, I don't think I knew the difference. It, it, it looks a lot the same, right? Yeah. You know, you're sitting in there's someone up at the top giving a sermon like it was all the same to me yeah um but related to that um i talked about sort of the spiritual traditions of the philippines um i remember being in the philippines and um whenever we would go wash the clothes in the river my mom would say okay you say the sentence before you step into the water wow. and um and it was a way of giving respect to the spirits of the water sure. because if you're not good to the water, it won't be good to you. Yeah. And so there was sort of, um, in addition to, you know, just doing the Catholic thing on Sundays and like learning the rosary and the hail Mary, the, our father and all those sort of memorization techniques and hearing the Christian story. In addition to that, I also had the, the day to day, you know, um, ritual of how one respects the earth and respects each other. Wow. Um, and then, I mean, and we, there were also, I don't know what the term is. Uh, my mom calls them witch doctors now. Like, but like whenever my mom or I would be sick, we would, you know, you call on your ancestor or your, your elder and they come and they just sort of interview, interview you, ask you what's going on with you. And usually they would have a connection um, to those in the afterlife or something or have a sense if there was a curse on you mm -hmm. and um, they would be able to offer you a remedy. And so um, it was funny whenever we were sick, we would have, you know, the typical Western, you know, take this drug, whatever. But then my mom would also have the consultation with the elder to say, okay, what do we need to do on top of that? Yeah. So no matter what we're covered, you know? Yeah. Um, 
And so, so that's sort of the religious spiritual part. But I would say that the lessons I got from my parents were of um, a lot of independence. Like you have to take care of yourself because um, others may not. Um, and so my mom, like I would say, um, was a good model for me. Um, her family was really poor. Like you think about developing countries, the Philippines, her family was extremely poor, um, a farming family. And um, so she left her home when she was 12 years old wow. because she was already working from a young age on the farm to help, you know, feed the family. But she had to leave her family behind and move to the big city um, so that she could make money to send home sure. as well as um, be able to go to school at the village that she was from. They didn't have school beyond sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And so to know that my mom was capable at that young age to not only provide for her family, but build her own future. Yeah. That was a model for me. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, yeah. 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 So like, in some ways, if you imagine your, your immigrant family or your, your parents' struggles and so forth, you're like, oh, my struggles, they're not so bad. Like, just think of what my parents went through. Yeah. Um, and I think I'll just give you, like, one more anecdote um, from my childhood. Yeah. Um, I was always, like, running errands. In the Philippines, I was running errands. Like, my mom would say, okay, you go there, you get the, the potatoes. Okay, you run up there, you go tell your cousin, you know, to do this, so forth. And I remember um, a very regular thing that we did in the evening when we were cooking dinner. Whenever dinner was done, she'd fill a bowl like with the soup and another bowl with rice. And she would say, you take this to the neighbor. Ah. And it, it was weird to me. I was just like, no matter what, it was like, you always take a plate of food to the neighbor. And uh, the lesson I learned from that is like, even though you don't, your neighbor didn't ask for it, you don't know if they might need it. Sure. And we were providing something, you know, just in case that that was a need. And so that was just something sort of ingrained in me that um, you take care of the other, even if they may not even need it. Wow. Wow. There, there's a lot to think about uh, in what you just shared. And uh, it's obvious that both your parents have a, a considerable influence on you uh, and particularly your mother. Um, I consider that. Uh, many mixed people have to, particularly like first generation mixed people, have to kind of negotiate uh, the diplomacy in, in receiving different teachings and different like traditions and cultures and navigate through, through finding something that's solidifying and unifying for one's, oneself. Uh, and it sounds like your mother does a lot of that herself, or at least that she has that tradition or that, that experience already that she shares with you in drawing from her, her Christian faith, but also her, her, her native Filipino faith as well, or the tribal uh, traditions and culture. Um, and so it, it sounds like, like she shares some of those lessons with you uh, as, a, as a child growing up uh, that, that you're able to kind of um, uh, apply to your personal experience at, uh, at being the child of your, your mother and your father as well. And, and kind of progress uh, through there. So that's, that's cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so then uh, with, that, with that being said, let's go to the third question. All right. Um, and the third question is, um, what challenges do you experience uh, growing up in childhood and in your youth um, in, in terms of just uh, – dealing with life, um, peers, teachers, colleagues, elders, or, or whatever, um, what, what are some of the, the challenges uh, that you experience uh, as a child and as a, as a youth growing up? Um, are you asking in relevance to my spirituality or my yeah, identity? I mean, primarily spirituality, primarily. but whatever, whatever like kind of stands out. If it was just like a bully or something like that, um, then, I mean, anything can be contextualized in a spiritual sense. So, I mean, it's just a matter of whatever kind of st sticks out for you, um, uh, whatever is prominent that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, I have one 
you know, I was, I was pretty young. I remember going to my grandma's church, the Methodist one, and this was in Arizona, um, just to add some context. I, um, so my sister and I were Filipino and, and, and white. Uh, we have cousins that were, um, were, we were really close with, I would considered him a brother and her a sister basically, cause we were growing up together and, um, they happened to be African-American and white. So, um, our, our parents were brother, sister. Right. And so we went to grandma's, you know, every other weekend or so. And, uh, it just happened that grandma's, uh, church, uh, was having a barbecue okay. and, um, Oh, all the kids are hanging out, you know, you're just in the yard playing ball, whatever it was. But I remember at one point, um, just, um, my cousin, um, who's African American, he got called out. Um, you know, he was doing pretty good at whatever sport it was. Sure. And some kid felt the need to, um, mention that he was dipped in chocolate and some other things like that. And I was like, I'm like three years younger than my cousin. I didn't really understand like what was going on and, or what this guy was talking about, but it just happened that, um, my aunt was close by, his mother was close by and she, she grabbed us all up and we left. Um, and I, I later understood, you know, what the situation was, um, and why my aunt was extremely upset. Sure. Um, although I, at that age had not recognized, um, any difference between me and any other kid. Uh-huh. Um, apparently some kids recognize a difference in us. And it just happened that this neighborhood was predominantly white. And at that point I realized, yeah, we were the only children of color and in some ways, um, yeah. And kids will be kids, right? If, um, someone's different, they tend to call it out. They tend to speak truth, right? And because my cousin was, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> thing, like because uh, my cousin was doing so well, of course, this other child felt the need to call out that difference yeah. as a negative. Yeah. And so that was one of my very early on, probably the earliest experience I have of like a racism that I didn't necessarily uh, experience as negative until the context or the story was sort of explained to me because I was too young to really understand, but that's How old were since you then, I'm sure. Ah, uh, I, you know, I was elementary age. I had to have been maybe five or six, okay. you know, maybe a little. Old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so anyways, um, I mean, you ask about one challenge, you know, you, you think going to a church, typically you have a good sense of a church community being really opening and welcoming and so forth. And especially going to Grandma's house, you expect to have a good time. Mm. Um, but that particular, you know, Sunday was just, was just kind of ruined at that point. Yeah. So does that have any effect on you uh, growing up as you mature from that point about, I mean, you, you got your kind of like your, your introductory lesson to race and identity and the hierarchies and the biases and, and prejudices that exist within that. Um, so how does that, how does your understanding mature uh, from that point uh, after that experience? You know, um, I sometimes think um, I used to, as children, we, we tend to have a simplistic view of life. And I think, um, there was always, there's sort of this understanding in the world or even among like Christians who say, you know, if you're Christian, you're a good person. Right. You know, if you have if you all these Christian beliefs, um, you'll do, you'll be good, whatever, no matter what. Um, and so my sense was um, this world is more complex than we make it. Right. So just because someone's a Christian doesn't mean they're not going to go to war yeah. clearly we've seen this, um, doesn't mean they're not going to hurt another person, you know, intentionally or not intentionally. And so I think, um, I learned from a young age that even if one feels safe and the context is safe and so forth, um, you always have to be ready for that complexity to, to meet you in the face. I don't know, you know, um, just, yeah, I don't know what to, what else to draw from that. 
I mean, right there, that's a powerful lesson because you're talking about uh, being in a safe space amongst loved ones, uh, but then still having that vulnerability and kind of be awakening to that vulnerability. Um, and uh, just because people say something uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case or there may be, it, like you say, is it, there, there's a complexity that comes with it as well. Uh, so that's, that's, a, um, that's a significant lesson uh, to learn. Um, that, that kind of, you, it's, it's like you can't be told that. You just kind of have to experience that for yourself and kind of understand that uh, through experience. So um, that, that uh, transition, transitions us to the fourth question. Uh, All right. So the fourth question is, uh, as you progress through life, as you mature and, and reach adulthood, um, what are some of the solutions that you find, um, given this this uh, experience of of um, differences and um, prejudice and um, the different experiences that you have in life? What are some of the solutions that you find uh, that that work for you as an adult? Um, you know, I. I work at Stanford University. I'm a big believer in academia, in education, period, in whatever form. And um, there's, what, what's that theory, the contact theory? If you just know someone different than you, you're less likely, you know, to, to demonize them, basically. Like, you see a campaign right now. It's like, meet your neighbor, meet, you know, meet a Muslim, meet a Sikh, yeah. so forth. Um, because if you know someone <laughs> I, i'm just i'm just m m mentioning our mutual friend skylar because he's he does that so I was, I was probably saying you're you're probably referencing that but go ahead yeah yeah well it's a big campaign right yeah. and so um uh for me um it took the form in my adult life i i studied religious studies because i was so interested in this difference you know i was like what are these other religions having grown up catholic and then having moved to guam catholicism was really all i i knew um was familiar with as a teenager and young adult and so when i came stateside for college um i was just curious i was like what what is a buddhist what is a jew mm -hmm. um and how to orient themselves to the world um and then through that, I got to meet, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews, atheists, so forth, everyone. And I'm a better person for it. And um, I want that sort of opportunity for other people. I want us to um, have religious literacy. Sure. I want us to feel comfortable despite difference. Yeah. Uh, and to be able to relate to someone who may be so different from us and yet be able to recognize that they're a human just like us. Sure. Um, so I've since forgotten your question, but I've got to go back yeah, to I mean, you're, you're talking about education. You're talking about knowledge, awareness, familiarity with others. Uh, those, those are very, very legitimate, valuable solutions in terms of, yeah. of reconciling our differences as individuals, but also the, the the experience of difference within ourselves as individuals. So, yeah, and actually, um, that makes a good point because yes, I think we should learn about others. Um, but on top of that, what interfaith work has taught me is um, I've learned a lot about myself. Okay. Like uh, by engaging people of different views, I've had to articulate my own views uh -huh. right to yeah. them. And I learn a few things about myself because mm -hmm. once you get certain questions, you're like, oh, let me think about that more. I, I'm, I may be unsure of my answer, but um, it's that inquiry that allows for, for some growth and um, just different opportunities. Really through like interfaith dialogue, I came to recognize certain biases in myself. Yeah. And, um, and once you can recognize a bias, um, you can then combat it and like inquire, like, why does that even exist? Yeah. Um, and so even as long as I've been doing interfaith work since, since college, like it's still important to continue doing, wow. um, because I'm constantly growing from it. Yeah. And engaging with the others we find additionally about ourselves. And like you said, particularly in doing interfaith work, when 
we get challenged, people ask us questions. And so we have to self-examine our, we, we have to go through self-examination uh, and, and explore what our, what our, our conclusions and our, our, our beliefs that often go unquestioned uh, if we, unless we engage with those who believe differently than ourselves. Uh, so I think that's a very valuable lesson uh, and solution uh, to find. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a question 4.5 uh, to kind of expand. Okay. And I know we're, we're, we're stretching the limit. We're at 30 minutes or so. Um, so, um, charging. So, okay. Let me make sure. Decent. There we go. Okay. Cool. <laughs> that cool. way it doesn't hang up on you. So we're good. Build, building on this notion of finding solutions. Um, as you, um, you also find another solution and that is your husband. Uh, and so you find, you find the solution of union um, and, and um, being committed with another individual who has that individual's own background and experiences and beliefs and spirituality as well. Uh, so how do you approach that uh, union and what, what are some of the, the, the shared experiences like spirituality or, or, or whatever uh, that that kind of guide that relationship um, and 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 bring you bring you together and hold you together. Interesting. Um, well, you know I'm an atheist, right, sure. and a humanist. You do, yeah. right? Okay. Um, so it's interesting that um, my husband, who I've been to, with for a long while, um, we we happen to both be atheists. And it's funny because um, we both went to the same college in Arizona and um, all of our friends that we had in common were Mormon. Okay. Um, but how, how interesting is it, right? That of all our friends, and I had dated a few different people in college in our in our group who were Mormon because um, I was fine with, with whatever worldview of a partner. But how interesting it is that I ended up with an, an atheist who shares my world worldview. Sure. Um, and so I think that does say something about how important uh, worldviews are to us, right? And I think in some ways, um, because we share that worldview, we're able to be close with one another or share just one more thing. Um, but um, in terms of difference, though, he was Mormon. He was raised Mormon. It was only, uh, I guess, in his adult life that he he wasn't so active in the church or anything and eventually was an atheist um but it's a bit more complicated when it comes to being a mormon because mormons are really tight communities sure. um and so if you're going to leave the church in some ways it's felt as like you're leaving the family okay. um so i can't necessarily identify with that experience especially sure. he's a white a white man um, and so there's a lot of things I can't identify with him but at least we we do share that that worldview um, and ooh, what was that <laughs> I heard a weird sound traffic hour at the moment so there's cars on the roads outside my windows open <laughs> it wasn't a judgment call <laughs> so what were we talking about like solutions or other uh, yeah. Connection. It's kind of like a collective solution that you find with with your husband uh, in terms mm -hmm. of both of you progressing along a respective spiritual path, but then you also coming together and sharing a path together. So uh, yeah. a, a lot of people who are who are dealing with these issues as being as mixed ethnicity and, and, and whatever uh, are younger uh, and are just coming kind of finding um or going through the issues of identity and belonging and finding solutions to that as well but there's also the kind of the next level um stage of life where you talk about settling down and finding a mate and 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 making a commitment and, and building together as well so i just wonder if you could provide some insight about how you approach that experience so i mean you, you do so and so so that's helpful but if there's anything else you have to share that's cool as well well i I think I, I would go back to my mother, how I talked about the independence I got from my parents and how, you know, it sort of relies on you to make a difference in your world and other people's worlds. Yeah. And so think about James and I, James, my husband, um, 
and how much you know we want to see this world better you right. know than it is now in a in a number of ways yeah. um and so as atheists we can't pray for the world yeah. um we can't wish and hope for the world uh i will give money towards a cause i will um build up a cause i will organize around a cause and i have to actively live out you know this betterment because um i don't believe in a next world or you know that people are going to be rewarded uh next time and so what that looks like for james and i is like actually living out um and really supporting as many causes as we're able obviously we're limited as humans um we can only do so much with so much time um but for us to feel good um you know in a relationship it's one thing we have to get along with a, a another person you know that's that can be a challenge but to feel good about our place in the world in this community in this in this neighborhood mm -hmm. um you have to sort of live out your values sure. um to feel good in any way i couldn't i could not feel good about my place in the world if um you know any number of horrible things continue to happen yeah. and uh it's just you know day by day the cause might might change or so forth but um i'm really dedicated to just putting what's the term like values into action sure um walking the walk like walking the walk yeah, yeah. and who who was it that said it uh you pray with your feet i um, um uh, i really I Abraham saying Abraham. because yeah Right. Yeah. And that makes sense to me, even though I, I, I don't pray, but yeah. it makes sense to me that I, I would want people to pray with their feet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and, and, um, uh, there's, you talk about walking the walk and, and living those, those precepts of righteousness and compassion and benevolence. Um, and that's also one thing I appreciate about the interfaith movement, um, overall, is that uh, obviously there are all these different religions and all these different beliefs. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's almost it's comparatively futile to try to get everybody to agree and, 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 and say we all believe the same thing. But uh, at the end of the day, we do have a common foundation of principles of righteousness and, and, and um, benevolence mm -hmm. and compassion that we do agree upon mm -hmm. um, and, and that, that involve our lives and our work and our actions in this life, in the here and now. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to engage with each other uh, in that shared compassion, in those shared teachings of righteousness uh, and, do, and, and do better and, and improve the well-being of, of individuals in this life. So um, I definitely appreciate that and I can testify to your work in that respect. Uh, so I appreciate that as well. So that leads us to the fifth question. Um, okay. And I feel like there should be a drum roll or something. But uh, the fifth question is, uh, what message do you have to share with the universe? Given, given your background, given the challenges, given the solutions that you find, um, what, what are the nuggets of wisdom and, and understanding and, and whatever else, uh, what message do you have to share with the universe? Interesting. <laughs> you know, it it sounds really scary, but um, it's up to us sure. to make a difference. It's up to you and me and every single person. Um, obviously, the self has to come first, right? If you're going to do anything, you need to come from a good place. And if you're not in a good place, you won't. Um, be able to enact good elsewhere. So um, you probably heard this before. Like the peace, peace starts with you, okay. right? So you you make make peace with yourself, right. and then you make peace with others, and that that sort of um, you know it ripples out. As you know, in some in some ways, you know, as an atheist, it's like how can I believe in that? There's it needs to be actionable and measured, and you know, where's the science in that? And yet I, I, from my experience in interfaith work and so forth, mm -hmm. I've done things um, when I was not at peace with myself and I could recognize the effect it then has on others, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 
And so, um, yeah, so my message for the universe is, yeah, um, be good to yourself. Right. And uh, once, once you've got that down, um, be good to others. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, is there anything else uh, you'd like to share? Any, any closing thoughts or words or anything? Um, well, I was actually just thinking about what we had said previously about the importance of interfaith work. And um, mm -hmm. what I really love about it is that um, it is a network and that there's people you can connect with, ask questions with, and, and learn from. Yeah. And we see, especially in the, the, the climate that we see right now here in the U.S. with um, that's hate that's being guided towards our Muslim, Sikh, and other people of color who are not your typical white American, um, how important it is that we have these connections. And um, yeah, I'm if I wasn't doing interfaith work, I don't know what I'd be doing because um, really I want to see this world changed and um, interfaith work is just something that I see as such a strong force for that change I want to see. Cool. Um, I think I'll just end with that. And um, I, I'm so interested to see if there's any sort of intersections or connections that you make in your two worlds interfaith and mixed race and what sort of uh, commonalities or differences that come up from all these interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, me too. Um, so it's, it's, it's happening. And um, I think that both, both elements or both realms are warming up to each other. Um, and uh, it's, there's a burgeoning dialogue. I try to do a, um, a, uh, a workshop on the mixed ethnicity experience at the parliament a few weeks ago, it got rejected. It got rejected. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I also did two other workshops, so it might have been like an o a workshop overload for me. Uh, so, who knows? but uh, yeah, so it, there's, there's, but a number of people communicate an interest in, in it. Uh, and so um, I appreciate that. Uh, and so it's, it's a matter of like negotiating the, the cultures and uh, the protocols uh, within each scene. Uh, and so, uh, as mixed people uh, and as interfaith activists, we kind of have uh, uh, experience doing that. So it's just uh, it's, it's a gradual process. So I continue to work on it. And I plan to share this with um, uh, with a number of groups and Facebook uh, groups on um, on uh, that, that deal with the mixed experience. So um, it's just it's just a foundation for for building uh, additional dialogue. So and, and understanding and, and, and outreach. So. I appreciate uh, your your uh, participation, uh, and it's nice to chop it up with you uh, as well, and, and learn uh, learn a little bit more about you. So uh, you have an interesting story, and I appreciate that. Uh, and you have some some uh, valuable um, morsels of of wisdom and insight uh, that I think many people can can benefit from. Uh, so so I appreciate you sharing that um, with me and, and with this with this project. Um, so, um, it's nice to see you a couple weeks, um, a couple months ago at the parliament. This is, the, this is the second, yeah. this is the second interview that I do with you. So I, I appreciate I it. <laughs> <laughs> I almost have that. Uh, always a good too. time. Yeah. Uh, are you planning to go to Guadalajara? <laughs> you know, um, I'd like to, I don't know if it's going to be possible with my, my schedule, but I'm, I'm keeping my calendar open as best I can. And so fingers crossed I'll make it there. And you're, you're trying as well, right? I'm working on getting the resources to together. I also have a credentials issue as well. So I might bite the uh, and get a, a passport, but we'll see. Uh, my politics are such that that has trouble with it. Uh, but eh, right. it's important. It's important. And I'm glad that it's in, in Mexico, in Mexico. Uh, so I want to support that. Yep. And uh, I'm, I actually have plans to go to Guadalajara anyways. So it's, it's nice to, to kind oh. of to have that. So, yeah, that's, that's another project. That kind of, <laughs> I know. This is the first, I mean, the first time they'll ever be, right, in Mexico. So it's mm -hmm. kind of amazing. And uh, I, we need to support them as best we can. Yeah, exactly. So cool. All right. Um, All right. Anything else? <laughs> 
No, uh, that was great. Thanks for uh, the interview. And it's always nice to engage these, these topics with you. Cool. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for fitting me in. And I look forward to uh, continuing our conversation uh, in, in the future. All right. Thanks so much, Peter. Take care. Bye. Bye.